السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته عم محمد حجاب This is Firas Zahabi and this is what we have coming up next As a result of the harm uh, that's associated with MMA a lot of the fatawa from an Islamic perspective that have come out and forbidden it professionally um, mm. What are your comments on this? Well, I'll tell you one thing. I, I'm not a I'm not a mufti, so yeah. I'll tell you if if there was if it's haram, I accept it's haram. Yeah, خلاص it's haram. Mm. However, so I've got a controversial question for you. What do you think would happen, <laughs> being GSP's uh, trainer and coach <laughs> <laughs> for so many years? What do you think? Because uh, we saw GSP coming uh, before the the fight, talking uh, on TV. Um, about a potential matchup with uh, with Khabib. So, what do you think would happen? A lot of people will know now that you've got a spiritual side, a philosophical side. We're seeing more and more sides to Faraz Zahabi the more we talk to him. But one thing I wanted to kind of bring to the attention of the Muslim community and kind of get your advice on, potentially one of the things that we'll kind of close off with, um, is healthy living, mm. um, because. That's one of your areas of expertise. You've, you've researched quite deeply and heavily into it because you've had to for, because you've trained fighters, because you train mm. different kinds of people from different kinds of um, sports. My question is, simple question, how do you maintain healthy living? What kind of food should people do? Balanced diet, what kind of things do you recommend? The number one rule for when it comes to nutrition, in my opinion, is <laughs> Assalamu alaikum for us, how are you Salaam doing? Alaikum. How are you doing? You okay? <laughs> See, as the MMA fighter, you're already fighting. <laughs> I'm already uh, breaking things. <laughs> breaking things. I'm smash the whole thing. <laughs> how are you doing? Alhamdulillah. You okay? How are you finding Amazing. London? I love it. Love you're a London. frequenter of London now. You come quite Yes, often. yes, yes. And I plan to come more often, uh, even more often. So, inshallah, we'll, we'll do this again. Alhamdulillah. I want to get straight into it with you, inshallah, because of the um, recent event, obviously, with uh, Khabib and um, uh, Poria. Um, a question I have for you in terms of martial arts, particularly because Khabib has a grappling background. Mm -hmm. um, what do you, how, in terms of effectiveness, how do you rank grappling in terms of the martial arts? Do you think it is one of the most effective ways to disarm or neutralize your opponent? I think grappling is 100% absolutely necessary. If you're going to learn self defense, you absolutely have to start with. The grappling arts, wrestling and jujitsu, absolutely, it's a it's a foundation in my opinion. Mm. For instance, if you wanted to use kickboxing or boxing to defend yourself, and your opponent grabs onto you, two 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 untrained opponents, uh, two untrained fighters in a closed area will end up on the ground very quickly. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you got to know the basics. Most fights end up in clinching, grabbing onto one another, especially in cramped areas. So if you know grappling and wrestling, you have the fundamentals of fighting there. However, striking is very important. After you've established a good level of grappling and wrestling, striking can be extremely important. In my opinion, if I'm in a one-on-one -on -one situation, the self-defense situation, it's one person, I'll use grappling. Yes. If it's more than one person, two or three people, which is a, a very difficult situation to uh, get yourself out, out of, obviously, I can, but I cannot use grappling now because as I'm holding one partner, one person, I can get hit by someone else. So I, then I would use striking. Maybe I would throw a kick or two and try to exit. I would throw some strikes, maybe uh, 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 hit, hurt one or two and just try to flee, you know, um, because when you're fighting multiple attackers, it's very dangerous. And But if you put yourself on the ground, it's a sure recipe for a disaster. So wrestling and jiu-jitsu, fundamental, absolutely fundamental. Striking arts, good for multiple attackers. And of course, uh, street defense. So in terms of people that may be more vulnerable, uh, maybe smaller individuals, uh, lighter individuals, women, what would you recommend for those people? I recommend at least blue belt in jiu-jitsu, minimum. Mm -hmm. Because jujitsu is the most uh, defensive martial so art. So breaking that down, what does that what does that mean? So, so you have first belt is white belt. Yeah. Second belt is blue belt, and mm -hmm. blue belt is defined by Elio Gracie, the mm -hmm. founder of uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, co-founder of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. He says, look, when you to be a blue belt, you have to be able to defend yourself against a bigger, stronger opponent who is untrained. Mm. If you can do that, then you're a blue belt. Blue belt doesn't mean 
you know, you train for 10 years, you can get a blue belt in a year mm. if you train consistently. Now, if, if a bigger, stronger attacker tries to subdue you, you'll be able to uh, counter and subdue that attacker. So I recommend everybody should be a blue belt. Like, for instance, my wife, she's a blue belt. I trained her till she got to blue belt. Why is blue belt so important? Well, because jiu-jitsu is the most defensive martial art. So, for instance, if I want to take you down and harm you, maybe your wrestling's too good and I can't take you down. Fine, no problem. And But if you want to take me down and harm me, you won't be able to find a blue belt because jiu-jitsu teaches you how to defend yourself on the ground. If you want to strike me, I'm going to be able to grab you and tie you up. Jiu-jitsu also teaches you how to subdue a striker, hold him down, control him. Jiu-jitsu is the most defensive art. Now, when we're doing MMA, there's a point system, there's a time limit, and uh, maybe wrestlers sometimes can beat a jiu-jitsu guy because they take him down, but they just hold him in long enough so they win the round. Jiu-jitsu was developed under a valetudo scenario. Valetudo means anything goes. Okay, in in Brazil, uh, they speak Portuguese. Portuguese is for anything goes. Anything goes fights. Valetudo fights were no time limit. So if a wrestler took you down, they, they, he couldn't play the points. He couldn't hold you down for 15 minutes until the referee says, you know what, you were on top. Top is better. Uh, excuse me. The judges uh, will give you the fight. They'll say, look, you held him down long enough. Congratulations, you win. In a Valetudo fight, fights would go on for hours sometimes. So the wrestler has to finish. But if they he, have a bit of ground and pound, maybe it would finish a bit earlier? It's very hard to ground upon a, a, a very experienced jiu-jitsu guy who mm. knows he has unlimited time. It is mm. very difficult. It's a highly defensive sport. Mm. So the best jiu-jitsu guys in the world, they're very hard to punch or hit on the ground. I'm telling you, well, it's very mm. difficult. Mm -hmm. If they have no time limit, they can operate in a very efficient way and relax. And it's... Eventually, the, the jiu-jitsu guy will get a sub because wrestling, they don't have any finishes. They're more of a control style. Mm. I love wrestling. I'm not trying to say anything about negative about wrestling. Okay? I wrestle just as much as I do jiu-jitsu. I, I wrestle all the time. I love wrestling. Ideally, both are the best. However, the most defensive, for self-defense, in my opinion, the foundation is jiu-jitsu. Mm. You were talking about um, a great jiu-jitsu person might be able to ward off someone's ground and pound. Uh, what do you think about Tony Ferguson and Khabib? I mean, do you think <laughs> Tony Ferguson might be able to ward off uh, Khabib's ground and pound? If there's anybody that can beat Khabib, which I don't think there is, I think Khabib is the best lightweight in history. Mm. I think uh, the only real contender is uh, Tony Ferguson because he, he does a lot of great jiu-jitsu, like you said. Mm. He's great at getting back to his feet. He's great at rolling out. He's very aggressive off his back. And then there's Islam Makachev. I think Islam Makachev is a great contender, but him and Khabib train together, and I think they're dear friends. They will never fight each other. I'm very confident they'll never fight each other. Mm. But those are the only two guys I could see right now in the, in the near future who have a chance against Khabib. Mm. Would you think that in those positions that Khabib put, uh, that Poirier put Khabib in, that Ferguson might have finished it off? Maybe the guillotines? That, the guillotine that uh, Poirier had on, mm. in my opinion, will lead more likely to a sweep than a finish. Right. Um, if it was Ferguson, both of them or this the second one? What do you mean? What was it the second one was the one where he took it for a long time? Yeah, the second one, in my opinion, mm. it, would, it would maybe lead to a sweep, but I don't think he had the grip and the position. Mm. Guillotines can be finishes for sure. Yeah, but not the way Poirier was holding it. In my opinion, that will lead more likely to a sweep, unlikely to choke an experienced a grappler slash wrestler like Khabib. Mm. Ferguson could have turned it into an anaconda or Darce choke. He's very known for his Darce chokes. Guillotine, anaconda, Darce. Uh, guillotine, anaconda, and Darce, they go together. So I think he could have chained it maybe, possibly. Um, however, um, the way Poirier was handling that guillotine, I didn't think he was going for a sweep. He was going for a choke, which I think he should have went for the sweep instead of the choke. Uh, I've worked with so many great guillotine guys in the past, uh, and, and even now, and... Um, you start to see the, the the different scenarios guillotines can bring. And that particular scenario, in my opinion, it wasn't going to be a finish. It was going to be either a sweep or Khabib gets out. Not mm. a finish, though. No. I, I would have been very surprised if he tapped. So I've got a controversial question for you. What do you think would happen <laughs> being GSP's uh, trainer and coach <laughs> <laughs> for so many years? What do you think? Because uh, we saw GSP coming uh, before the, the fight talking uh, on TV. Um, about a potential matchup with uh, with Khabib. So what do you think would happen 
if they can well take i'll tell you something outside of all the fighters i work with yeah. khabib's my favorite fighter yeah okay? so i know i'm gonna i know i have I, it's impossible for me not to be biased okay mm. but i'm telling you how much i have respect for khabib how much i admire him mm. he's outside of fighters i train he's my favorite fighter mm. okay um i think george uh, and this is just me trying to be as objective as possible mm. he's more complete mm. to, to be honest okay mm. One, his hands are more uh, refined. His punching skills are more refined. Mm. And two, his kicking skills is far more refined than Khabib. Mm. So if George were to play it safe, which I don't think he would, okay, he could just outpoint Khabib just with his legs, in my opinion. George has very seasoned legs, okay, very experienced uh, kicking ability. Are you giving away the game plan now? No, I'm not giving away. <laughs> I, think, I think most 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 people who watch MMA really, really closely, they yeah. know this already. It wouldn't be mm. something that, that we're hiding. It's like saying, oh, Khabib's really good mm. with grappling. Yeah, for sure. We all, you know, like, yeah. so George, George has great kicking ability, great kicking ability. And he's got no good doubt. takedowns as well, isn't he? He's a great wrestler. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Like, his chances of putting Khabib on his back are just as good as Khabib putting him on his back. Yeah. And, and he's heavier and bigger and stronger. He's heavier, well. bigger and stronger. Plus, he'll be able to set up his takedowns more mm. because of his longer range and more seasoned striking ability. Mm. So if I put them in a wrestling match, maybe it would be very heated. Yeah. But if I add George's striking, George is very clever to use his striking for setups to close the distance, to get close to the legs, to grab onto you. Now, they also have very different wrestling styles. Khabib shoots very low often. Mm. That's not, In my opinion, it will be very difficult to score on, 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 on a Jason Pierre. Mm. Very difficult. Because he, he's just too big, too strong, too athletic, and very seasoned wrestler. DC says that he sometimes gets into these... Uh, that basically he feels like Khabib can can roll with uh, heavier guys, heavy, like himself. He's a heavyweight, obviously. Mm. He does wrestling with him. He, mm. says he feels like a heavyweight. Yeah, I, I can... I, I would believe that, but... Uh, mm. George is also a phenomenal wrestler. Like, I, I agree. They're both phenomenal wrestlers. I'm not, I'm not mm. saying... George mm. also out wrestle heavier guys and mm. it's not uncommon I've, I've seen him do it a, a countless times mm. what i'm saying is let's call the wrestling even for now just to make everybody happy right george is striking will give him a, such a strong edge mm. that he'll set it, it that that edge will lead to him dominating in wrestling so in Khabib, if you're listening just, <laughs> <laughs> just finish with the kicker I, 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 and leave He's um, the king of 155. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. George is the king of 170. Yeah. Khabib's the king of 155. If Khabib was George's size, it would be a tougher challenge for George. But George right now, he's taller, longer reach, and more seasoned striking. So in my opinion, look, again, it's just an opinion. You know, We'd have to have the fight to see really what would happen. Opinions don't mean anything, really. I have a question <coughs> on, on this, actually. Um, recently, we've seen Jordan uh, Burroughs, mm -hmm. uh, Olympic wrestler, um, with Ben Askren. In this kind of like wrestling match, mm -hmm. and he he kind of destroyed, humiliated. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sure it was a one-sided affair, yeah, yes. <laughs> right? It dominated, um, dominated. Let's say dominated. Ben Askren, yes. uh, like in a way which most mm -hmm. people wouldn't have expected. Is there a major difference between wrestling, pure wrestling, and wrestling, for example, in the way that Khabib does it, in like a sambo sense or an MMA sense? And one does all, uh, one always translate to the other? So in a sense. What would you think would happen, for example, if Khabib wrestled uh, Jordan uh, Burroughs? I'll tell you guys something, okay? What Burroughs did to Askren, he does to other world-class wrestlers. Yeah. He's arguably, well, he's definitely one of the greatest American wrestlers of all time. Yeah. He's a phenom. He's predisposed for wrestling. You know, there's a, there's a word we usually use, it's called the word talent. What does it mean, talent, exactly? Mm -hmm. Like, is this is there something magical? No, no. The, talent, in my opinion, is just, are you predisposed for this particular activity? Mm. Not everybody's the same size. Not everybody has the same reach. Not everybody has the same um, wiring, neurological wiring. Not everybody has the same muscle fiber. Not everybody has the same um, uh, nervous system. There are things, there are advantages to being built a certain way. Like, for instance, Hussein Bolt, mm. if he had a mediocre coach, he would still be a great runner. He'd be phenomenal. Actually, people don't know this, but he's often criticized for his technique. His technique is not perfect. Mm -hmm. So you hear great runners critique him. Great coaches be like, look, he does this wrong. He, he could be faster even. If he had a more technique, he'd be even faster. But he's still the fastest guy ever. Mm. Why? He's predisposed for that event. Genetically. Genetically. There's a lot of components to um, sprinting. He has a natural predisposition for this sport now for instance if i took him and i put him in the chess world 
he would probably maybe he maybe he'd be completely untalented. Maybe he'd yeah. be ranked five thousand. <laughs> so ta- what does talent mean? Talent yeah. means am I predisposed for this particular, very particular activity? Mm-hmm. Like for instance, I could take somebody who's predisposed for like boxing. Phelps, for, for example, is predisposed Michael, for. I would he, tell even you. his body is anatomy, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Let's say I took Mike Tyson for instance. Mm-hmm. Mike Tyson's, in my opinion, is predisposed for punching. Mm-hmm. How did they discover Mike Tyson? Well, one day he got into a street fight as a kid mm-hmm. and he knocked a guy out and people were like, whoa, mm-hmm. what, what kind of punch is this? Mm-hmm. And then they brought him to a boxing gym and every, all the coaches were like, this is incredible. Customado was like, you'll be world champion. I can mold you. You're young. You're this, you got this incredible power. Mm-hmm. Sprinters have a great, uh, sprint coaches have a great saying. They say, we can't make you fast. We can make you faster. So all our skills and our technique and me, I always say, look, if you're a regular Joe and you come train with me five, 10 years, I can get you to UFC level. Mm-hmm. I can get you there. Mm-hmm. To get to the top 15, you have to have something special, man. Mm. To get to world champion, you have to have something special. Mm. The, 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 the way, the training methods we have, mm. maybe in the future, they'll become more advanced and we can turn anybody into a world champion. Yep. They're not that sophisticated. They're sophisticated enough to make you really dangerous. Mm to make you be able to defend yourself against anybody? Yeah. I would say yes. The, to make you uh, successful, MMA, yes. To make you re- a thousand times better than you used to be, yes. Mm-hmm. But a guy like John Jones, he's predisposed for certain activities and punching and kicking is one of them. His reach is- it's 84 reach, a seven it's, foot it's, reach. It's absurd. Uh, he's, mm. he, in the light heavyweight division, he's longer. he has a longer reach than all the heavyweights. Mm. Should he be a heavyweight then? Um, I think it would be good, you know. Mm. I think I think there's a lot to the weight cutting. Like I think mm. he loses more weight than everybody else, but it's the same percentage. I think mm. he's bigger than all the guys he fights, save mm. a few handful. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he's also he's got other things. He's not just bigger. He's athletic. He's smart. He's intelligent. He's creative. Mm. Like him or not, the guy's a creative human being. When he's in there, he's doing a lot of creative things, and uh, he's predisposed for this sport. He, but he also has a lifetime of training behind him. So you can have a guy who has a lifetime of training behind him. He's not predisposed for the sport. He'll do well. Then you got a guy like John Jones who has a lifetime of training and he's predisposed. Mm. One of my favorite books ever written um, is uh, Peter Drucker's... No, um, Peter Drucker's... Um, Let me write this down. <laughs> uh, um, what's it called? Peter Drucker's book. I always recommend this book, but now I'm low on... My blood sugar's level is low. Peter Drucker's, uh, oh my God. We'll do, what, we'll do what Joe Rogan does, someone from production, Peter <laughs> Drucker's, come on. I yeah. recommend this book maybe like a thousand times in my life. Yeah. Hold on, hold on. Hold on. We'll get someone from production to, uh, you're have to, <laughs> to you're, you're have to forgive, forgive me. That's right. Dude, it's a small little book, it's a 50 page book. Production? I mean, what's happening? This is usually. Managing oneself. That's okay, oh my right. Lord, I can't forgot it. <laughs> Uh, if this really was Joe Rogan's show, they would have said it like, you know. <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We need an internet guy. Yeah. Knowing oneself. Listen, it's a really simple book. I'm going to sum it up to you in, in two minutes. Okay. Literally, you don't want to have to read. It's a 50-page book. It, it takes 30 minutes to 20 minutes to read. And he says, look, he, this guy, by the way, Peter Drucker, wrote the, the manual on management. Mm-hmm. Like everything they learn in management in universities now, it's all on Peter Drucker, based on Peter Drucker. Okay. Mm-hmm. So he says, look, first thing, we read this little book. That's the first one. Mm. He says, "Look, look in the mirror. What are you? Ta- what are your talents? What are you predisposed for? Mm. Don't try to be something you're not. Don't try to be Hussein Bolt. Mm. If when you went to the track meet, you didn't have some kind of something to work with, you weren't mm. super explosive. You mm. were, you didn't have something that predisposes you for track and field. Maybe you're predisposed for chess, but you wasted your life running on the track. Yeah." You understand? Yeah. Find out first. He says, "Look in the mirror. Find out what's the best thing about you." And he gives you tips like, "What are your when you were young? What did your parents tell you? You know, what did your neighbors tell you? What did, what did they notice about you? Because that's something adults will notice about a kid. Now that they have more experience, they'll notice. Hey, this kid, his memory is incredible, or this guy, uh, he's he's incredibly uh, articulate. Maybe he should be a writer. Maybe he expresses ideas. He has a way of communicating with people. Uh, maybe this person is very char- charismatic. Okay, maybe he'll be uh, good for reaching out to young troubled youth." Whatever the case may be, hmm. a good manager will see, look at his group, and he'll be like, this one belongs here, this one will do this. So, for instance, some people, they're overqualified for a job. Like some people, let's say, maybe you're working as a fireman, but you're miserable as a fireman. 
I'll give you a for instance. This is Peter Drucker, based on Peter Drucker's work. Why? Maybe you're, you're high, your IQ is too high. Maybe you're an intellectual. Maybe you were supposed to be a, a thinker of sorts. Maybe you're, because you're, you're bored at your job. Why are you bored? This doesn't stimulate you. While another person, being a, a fireman is the greatest joy. He does fitness. Uh, he, he likes to handle the truck. This day-to-day -day activity for me is satisfying. So Peter Jarko would say, look, that's, you know, you have uh, you want to help people. You want to be a hero. You have this, this. Okay, do that. You'll be excellent at that. So I really believe in this. I, I think it's great. Like, for instance, some people tell me, what's more important, grappling or striking? I always say it depends on the guy. <laughs> look how many world champions there are. Some were grapplers, some were strikers, some were wrestlers. I wouldn't fight like Khabib because I'm not predisposed like Khabib. I, I don't have those. I don't have that in me. Like, for instance, George does things I don't do. But I know exactly what he does. I was with him in the practice room. I know exactly step by step. I will never shoot doubles like a Jordan Burroughs per se. But there are other f ways to become super successful in the sport. That's why styles matter. Like for instance, Ali didn't fight like Mike Tyson at all. Muhammad Ali didn't fight like Mike Tyson mm -hmm. at all. If he did, he would be unsuccessful. Right. He fought in a way that was complementary to his abilities. He had incredible reflexes. He had incredible eyes. If you threw a punch at him, well, like he's, he's, his speed and his rhythm. If he tried to copy Mike Tyson, he would lose. If Mike Tyson tried to copy Muhammad Ali, he would lose. They all fought. They were all smart enough to fight in a way that makes sense for them. And life is like this. You got to look in the mirror. What works for me? Where do I belong? What talents do I have? And don't try to st strengthen your weaknesses. Mm. Phase one is find what talents you are and go for it. F go in that field. Everybody has a talent. Do you know who said that one time? And I found it quite interesting. There's a very famous recital of Quran called Abdul Basit Abdul Samad. Yeah. And um, he was interviewed one time. And, and the, the interviewer said to him, because he has an amazing voice, like mm -hmm. incredible, probably mm -hmm. the most famous of all time. Um, and they asked him, what do you advise other, Quran, other reciters of Quran? I said, don't try and copy my style. Mm -hmm. He said, exactly. "Find your own style that exactly. that is that, that complements your own mm -hmm. voice. Mm -hmm. Don't try and copy my style." And this is very much in line with what you're saying. But I wanted to kind of comment on on the question of because you mentioned Muhammad Ali. I think it's very important mm. historical figure. Mm -hmm. I think nowadays fighters are fighters. That's what they are. Mm -hmm. A lot of the time, they're just kind of under the remit of say the UFC, Bellator, uh, another company. You know, might be a striking company, K1, whatever it may be. And they've got their contract. They do what they want to do. Before, in the time of Ali, the reason what made him kind of stick out as a historical figure is because he was right in the middle of the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. He had kind of like a cause. Mm -hmm. He had something mm -hmm. that he wanted to, mm -hmm. to, to, to share with the world, if you like. He wasn't justified. He was a historical figure. If he wasn't a boxer, he'd still be remembered, if, 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 if you like. So the question is, do you think that nowadays um, fighters are becoming kind of just like uh, part of the system a little bit too much or they don't have their own um, they're not coming out with anything new for the world or they're, they're not doing those kinds of things that we saw people in the 60s do for example well Muhammad Ali in my, in my opinion was very intelligent yeah he was aware of what was going on around him mm. when he fought George Foreman in Zaire George Foreman brought German Shepherd with him and Muhammad Ali criticized him for it. George Foreman to him, that's just my dog. But he was saying, look, when the Westerners came here, they brought German shepherds to round up our, our, our black people. Wow. Now, I am have nothing against German shepherds. Yeah. But the fact that Foreman doesn't know that, Foreman should know and say, look, you know, that has nothing to do with the animal. But the fact he came in naively. Right. Because their whole thing was, look, we went to the West, we became kings. Our fathers were slaves. We became kings. Now we're coming back to Zaire. We're coming back to Africa to show everybody that we're kings, to, to, to spring up their economy, to show them, you know, like we made it out there. Yes, we went in slave ships, but we came back. Foreman didn't have that in his mind. Mm -hmm. He was going there just to be, fight Muhammad Ali to get his purse. Muhammad Ali was thinking on another level completely. And, you know, of course, there was the, you know, at first he was influenced by the nation of Islam. Mm. put all these ideas in his head mm. and I, i'm sure you're familiar with malcolm x mm -hmm. he went to mecca he saw look the whole world when they sleep because mecca is the whole world is in mecca if mm. you want if you go a trip around mecca they say it's a trip around the world yeah it's amazing malcolm x said look when they were sleeping everybody snores the same everybody the brotherhood was so strong he felt no racism mm. there was no subjugation mm. everybody was equal 
really, a, the, in my opinion, the only religion with zero racism. Mm. Like, the, the ideas that were propagated in Islam during its time were preposterous to the people at that time. Mm. Preposterous. Mm -hmm. All Everybody's equal. Mm. Uh, mixed races can marry. Uh, it's not a problem. This is unheard of at that time. Today, it's self-evident. Today, it's obvious. And Malcolm X influence, uh, had an influence on Ali. Ali later, of course, he became a uh, Sunni Muslim. Mm. But he was heavily indoctrinated at first by Nation of Islam. Nation of Islam. But I applaud him for coming out of that. Mm. For saying, look, you know what? At the end of the day, no, it's not about... Uh, but the Nation of Islam had a hand in educating him of his particular situation. Mm -hmm. And he came out of that which I applaud him because he, he was r r rational and it wasn't in his benefit to, to come out of that per se. Like for instance, Michael Max, they killed him for it. They killed mm -hmm. him for coming out of, how, from what I understand, they, that's why they, yeah. they assassinated him mm -hmm. because he started going against the nation, nation of Islam. Mm -hmm. So Muhammad Ali, in my opinion, was far more aware of his political situation than any fighter nowadays. He was really more aware of what was going on between blacks and whites and the world around him. Whereas most fighters today, they're just focused on preparing for fights and do that. That's, right. That's why I have such amazing respect for Ali. Mm. He really changed the world. Mm. He changed the world. He's a, he's a great influencer. Mm. So in that case, if there, are, if there are people who are fighters and they have platforms, there are lots of issues in the world. Like you said, racism is one of them, right? Um, global warming or whatever it may be, like some, something that people fi find very important to them which they can use to change the world, um, their platform. Would you say that it's an important thing then to kind of encourage people to do that? So they don't feel like after their kind of career has ended that they've died two deaths as a sportsman and then once again as, a, as an individual. I think when you make it, when you make it big, it's time to give back. Yeah. Because you made it big because people helped you. There's a long line of people who helped you get to the top. Mm. Me, look, I've, I've had a lot of success, alhamdulillah. I always look for giving back. How mm. can I give back? Mm. You know, what can I do? Mm. How can I help the people? You know, just everybody, anybody. And if you don't, some people become successful and all they think about is themselves. Yeah. Me, me, me. What am I going to do? And in my opinion, they create their own hell around them because now they have to wear a $50,000 watch. They have to wear a $100,000 or a $10,000 tie or whatnot. And then you, st you build this lifestyle that you have to maintain. And to maintain this lifestyle, you have to do a thousand one things. You have to behave in a particular way. Why? Because that lifestyle has to be maintained. Mm -hmm. And it's a burden, that lifestyle, to maintain it. And now your kids, they're used to Armani. They're used to this. And in my opinion, I've seen this, okay? I've seen this. And I, I'm not trying to single anybody out, but I've seen that this, okay, now it has become a monster, this. Because now... You're traveling in a city, but you can't sleep in a regular hotel. It has to be this standard. Mm. But maybe the money wasn't flowing like it used to. Maybe mm. the, the glory days are fading away and That's there's right. new champions and there's yeah. new superstars. Yeah. And now your bankroll, the cash flow is not as great as it used to be. Yeah. Now you, you want to slow the boat down, but you can't. So oftentimes people are tempted to do something wild and crazy or illegal or, or like push the envelope because they don't want to let go of that lifestyle. And whereas other fighters, like for instance, Khabib, which is, well, he's one of my reasons why he's my, one of my favorite fighters is after he won the world championship, he went to dig wells in Africa. That's a great human being, in my opinion. Instead of going to buy himself a fancy car. And Poria did the same thing. Yeah, uh, thing. instead of marrying the people. supermodel and buying this watch, and uh, yeah. he went to dig wells. Yeah. And listen, if you've ever been thirsty, you know, in Ramadan, mm. you've been thirsty, mm. you have an idea of what, you don't know what they're going through but you have mm. an idea and for me like when i do ramadan man, i think to myself well i some kids some kids somewhere is hungry like this mm. like it, it makes a grown man want to cry like mm. like not cry but it's torture it's not torture i shouldn't say it's, but it can be very difficult and <laughs> you think wow i'm gonna eat tonight some kid out there is not gonna eat tonight yeah it's amazing so for me it's it's unbearable to see somebody go hungry it's unbearable mm. the thought of it is unbearable so i assume um, Khabib has that same experience. He's like, you know what? There's people out there. They don't mm. even have fresh water. Mm. And that's why I have the utmost respect for him because that's another level. That's just another level. You're taking, you're, you're doing something on another level. He's giving back on another level. Mm. But uh, most people, when they make it, it's me, myself, and I, in a way. One more thing in regards to, we kind of had a discussion about this before the show, about. Um, kind of some of the harms that are associated with MMA, a lot of the wear mm. and tear. 
And uh, as a result of the harm uh, that's associated with MMA, a lot of the fatawa from an Islamic perspective that have come out and forbidden it professionally, um, mm-hmm. or at least segments of it, for example, striking the face. Um, there's a hadith which uh, is, um, if if one of your brothers, if uh, any of you have an uh, altercation with your brother, then let them, um, kind of not strike the face for in Allah khalaqa Adam ala surati because Allah created Adam on Adam's image. So some scholars say, well, you know, hitting the face and causing harm to your opponent is something which is forbidden in Islam. Uh, in fact, this is the majority opinion in Sunni Islam and I think Shia Islam as well. Therefore, uh, the sport of MMA, professionally done, it should not be something which anyone should aspire to in that sense. What are your comments on this? Well, I'll tell you one thing. I, I'm not a I'm not a mufti, so yeah. I'll tell you if if there was, if it's haram, I accept it's haram. Yeah, خلاص it's haram. Yeah. However, I want to know. I I have I have counter arguments to make, and I would like to make them in front of a, a mufti. Yeah. To, to, well, if to a mufti see. was in front of you, yeah, I would lo- I would love to see. <laughs> If there's a possibility mm. that it's actually not haram, if they knew more, because the thing is, they're, they're not in this world. They're maybe not 100% aware of what we're doing exactly. So we'll send what you say uh, to inshallah, Muslims. Inshallah. Let, me, <laughs> let me make it more clear a little right, bit. Let, so, let me make yeah. it more clear. I've, okay, if there's an altercation, you don't hit each other in the face. I totally get that. Yeah. But this is not an altercation. Mm. This is not an altercation. Mm. A professional bout is by no means an altercation. A professional bout... The reason why we here's my intention, because intention is, in my opinion, the the backbone of my argument. I'm going in there to see what really works, because I'm teaching martial arts as a professional. Mm. I teach people how to defend themselves. People send me their young children, mm. young adults come in. Somebody got beat up. Somebody was attacked. Somebody wants to learn how to defend themselves. They're getting bullied. Mm. They ask me, Coach, how do you defend yourself? Mm. I have to be sure what I'm teaching is authentic and real. Mm. To do that, I have to train at high intensity. I don't think anybody will say training boxing is haram. I think they're all yeah. unanimously say it's okay. Training is all right. But we still don't know until we actually do a professional bout because the things we do in practice, because of the equipment and this and that, in particular details, they're not. It's not really a fight, and in a fight, things are different. Mm. And these nuances you wouldn't know unless you've done it. Mm. Because we do it, we've learned so much about martial arts. So when it comes to helping the community of how to defend yourself, I can tell them, look, this is where you want to be. This is what you want to do. And MMA, in my opinion, helps us do that. Because if you look at martial arts before MMA, we were completely ignorant about what really works. Yeah, that's true. I, I wouldn't say completely. We were to very a high, ignorant. To a high extent. To a yeah. high extent. Yeah. So you're saying from 94, for example, with the first exactly. UFC, it's been a real exper- experiential process for us where we've kind of experimented with what works. A lot of things have been flushed away. Where would we be without MMA? Yeah, right. We would be people who don't really know how to defend themselves. Yeah. We would be ignorant. And for me... MMA, these, these... It's been like a scientific experiment. Exactly. Right. These these fighters, if they're doing it in the intention, look, I'm going to learn everything about MMA. I'm going to learn everything about defense. Maybe one day there's a war. Maybe one day there's not a war. Maybe one day I need my my uh, my martial arts skills to defend somebody and I'll be there. Mm. But to do this, I have to go as far as... I have to become a master of martial arts. And I'm going to do it professionally so they're going to pay me so I can continue. Mm-hmm. However, if your intention is I'm going to go in there and hurt somebody and take money and praise myself mm. and I love the violence and I'm going to glorify it and okay, that I agree is totally haram. Mm. Me, when I go there, my intention is to learn, mm. is to become more skilled, more knowledgeable. Mm. So if somebody tells me, hey, how do we protect ourselves? Mm-hmm. I have an answer that I'm very confident in. Mm. This is my intention. It's to be to learn what is authentic on the battlefield. Yes. Yes, we make money with it. Mm-hmm. But it's so we can go full time in this endeavor, mm-hmm. full time. Mm-hmm. So you're saying that this is required for civilization to actually, to 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 kind of uh, progress in a way. I'll give you I'll give you a story. <laughs> a few months ago, I did a citizen's arrest. Really? A young well, in man in Canada. In Canada, a young man did something unspeakable. Really? What did he I do? I can't I can't even tell you what he. Did. <laughs> he exposed himself to a young girl, like a child, like a little child and a woman. Okay? Oh man. Let me tell you, like, he did something really like, so 
nobody was around like nobody nobody to help was around mm. so when help was called for i was the only one to take action mm. everybody else was very like we don't we don't do action yes but i'm a trained martial artist for me grabbing him putting him on the ground arresting yeah. him yeah. was very easy mm. this guy had a very bad day this guy he's gonna end up in jail this guy like uh, he's go believe me what he did he's going to jail mm -hmm. now he might have gotten away had there not been somebody who's a black belt in jiu-jitsu who can grab him hold him i wasn't scared of malal big guy tall guy he's like six feet mashallah mm -hmm. big guy i took him down held him down and told him he's not going nowhere when the security came asked him you want to no they're like hold him you what, what what group did you put him in my body locked him <laughs> out to death put him in a gift wrap i wrapped him up like a, like a, a yeah haram poor kid i took his license who is this kid and how can you do this like this kid's out of his mind but the thing the truth of the matter is nobody in the environment yeah. would lay a finger on him mm. Because they, they were not They're confident. untrained. They're completely right. untrained. Yeah. Now, in my opinion, martial arts work because we tested it. It's like every other science. Yeah. And in my opinion, it comes down to intention. Yeah. However, after hearing this, if they all tell me it's haram, I can see it's haram. Well, I think the, 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 the aspects you're talking about, they wouldn't say it's haram. So, for example, grappling. The, there is actually a hadith of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam doing a grappling match. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's, it, there is um, aspersion on, on the... Uh, uh, authenticity of the hadith hadith of him wrestling Rukana. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if you've heard of this and then yeah, he defeated yeah, him yes, and yes, Rukana yes. was but uh, so and there's no doubt that the Sahaba practice grappling like the companions of and combat sports yeah and uh, combat sword, sword fighting, sword fighting yeah, horseback riding there's no doubt about that for the purpose of combat yeah so. and and so on and so forth there's there's zero doubt about that the, the the one issue here that seems to be one of the most prominent issues mm -hmm. is striking in the in the head and the face mm -hmm. um Recently, obviously, I think um, I think um, if it wasn't you, someone else was talking about on a podcast the issue of CTE, mm -hmm, like mm -hmm, you know, brain damage mm -hmm. and so on. Well, where is the line where it becomes beneficial mm -hmm. and the wear and tear is not so prominent that it would actually mm -hmm. take away from people's other goals in life? So, for example, if someone's trying to study, a young kid is trying to study or trying to make himself more intelligent, more knowledgeable, but at the same time going box, boxing every week and doing heavy sparring, for example, mm -hmm. uh, professional bouts and so on. This is causing him uh, or even her, you know, real brain damage, mm -hmm. CTE and so on. Is is that advisable in your, in your, in your opinion? Or would you say actually maybe you should, because you've got this uh, philosophy of training less intense, Mm -hmm. Not to, to prevent that. Yeah, I, I believe. Look, I don't let young kids spar. Yeah, I, I like. I think you should spar only like seventeen, eighteen. It has to be very controlled sparring. Yeah, touch sparring, as I like to say, mm. and only the professionals. After years and years, and you have to go from one step to another. Then you have to go to okay, a boxing bouts with uh, twelve ounce gloves. Mm. These are much larger gloves, larger gloves. The professionals fight with four ounce gloves. Like you have to build your way till. I don't believe you should fight professionally unless you know what you're really doing. And it's rare you're gonna get hurt. It mm. it'll happen. It'll happen. Believe me, but it's rare. Mm. It's it's you're not gonna ha you're not gonna get hurt ten times in a row. And then you, okay, if that happens, you have to retire. So maybe <laughs> you're not. You're, it's not for you. Mm -hmm. However, we took so many steps to get there. The two fighters. Well, yes, to you it might seem like they got hurt, but to us it's nothing. Kicking the leg, punching the chin. To us it's nothing, and that's what it is really. It's a level of experience where what you deem as really dangerous, I don't see it as dangerous no more. Mm. We got to that level. And that's what I'm trying to, to say is supremely important. Like, for instance, now we're in a time of relative peace, yeah? So what do our warriors do? Well, they play sports. Mm. They keep that fighting instinct alive because that's what it is. Football is two armies coming together. Basketball is two armies coming together. Instead of killing one another, we're going to try to best one another with this. And you're, and you're, and you're sharpening your claws, strategy, endurance, uh, toughness. But we're not actually at war. Mm. Sports is a, is it's a, it's this it's this it's, a, it's a surrogate to war. But our warriors are always ready. If one day we need them, we cultivated them. MMA is the next the high the top top of the warriors, the warrior class. These guys are the most they have the most powerful the the most uh um they have the highest level of warrior spirit. Mm. Where do they go? Do you, do you think that then? Yes, yeah. yes. We need them in our society because tomorrow yeah. if a war breaks out, mm. those guys are made of a special something that we're going to need them. Mm. Uh, to shun them, to say that they're not, they have no place in society. Okay, mm. say that now. Mm. But tomorrow, 
when the, if an invader comes, mm. you're gonna wish we had cultivated them. You're gonna wish they were here with us. Mm. Now, look, th this all to say, I'm not, I'm not, I don't believe we should hit each other. Obviously not. Okay, I, mm. I agree. There's no shouldn't be hitting in the face. But the way I understand it, to be honest with you, mm. is for corporal punishment, mm. uh, dispute between two two individuals. Mm. This is a combat sport by two highly trained individuals mm. with rules. It's not a conflict. It's not a. It's not a. a it's not a it's not it's a fight it's an mma match there's no heat maybe sometimes there is but it's not supposed to be yeah it's two guys coming here to better our skills we're studying it like a under a microscope every small movement mm -hmm. every detail and we we do the experiment over and over again and every time we're still learning things like for instance khabib now he's restarted us back to 10 years ago uh, 20 years ago where Hoyes Gracie would take everybody down and beat them. That that stopped for a long time. Nobody was able to do that. Now Khabib is bringing it back. He's using a formula from years ago. How come it's working again? It's much more th things for us to unpack. Mm -hmm. But one day, we're one day in the future, we're going to be even more refined than we are today. And when some young kid comes to us and says, how do I defend myself? How do I protect myself? Well, we know. Our Oma knows. How to do that? S some, me, you know what I don't like? Yeah. Somebody else knows something I don't know. Yes. Somebody for me, knowledge is number one. Mm -hmm. That's why my intention is to learn. You know, somebody yesterday was asking me. Uh, I gave a seminar. He's asking me, who other, co which other coach like you knows all the sports, like kickboxing, rest at your level? Mm. And I was trying to think in my head. Well, that coach, he's an expert kickboxer. That coach, is an expert wrestler. That coach is an expert grappler. He does a little bit of everything else, but he doesn't have a black belt in that style. I have a, I have a. I have a, an expertise in all the styles. And I thought to myself, you know what? It's true. There's a very few guys who have that expertise. And I was thinking about because I was trying to come up with a name. No, no, there's a... There, and I, I couldn't really think of a guy who does it all. Like, I've met guys who are better grapplers than me, better strikers than me. But it's like, it's like George's formula, for instance. George, it's... We've never seen a guy... We've never seen a guy who has it all like him. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I grew up side by side with him, coming through the same style, the same routine. And it's true, it's very hard to pack everything in at once. It is very difficult. There are, of course, fighters who have done that, fighters. But in terms of coaches, because the coaches, there's no MMA coach that's been around for 35 years because the sport is only 25 years, mm -hmm. coming on to close to 30 now. Mm -hmm. So there's no old timers per se. In MMA, there's old time boxing coaches, old time wrestling coaches. So yes, we, we combine them. We bring four or five coaches to train one fighter. In the future, 50 years from now, it's probably going to be one coach training a whole team because he does it all. This is coming our way. So there's always new things to learn, uh, how to put it all together. There's so much to know. Why am I sitting here and letting others, other groups learn more than me? Mm. They know more than me because they're experimenting. They're going into the trenches. They're, they're learning more and they're surpassing us. Yeah. But why? Mm. And I think it's it's limiting ourselves. In my opinion, that those hadiths, again, I'm not a mufti, so please, if, if the muftis disagree, I agree with you, khalas. If you, if you have consensus, if all the muftis agree that I'm wrong, khalas, I agree with you guys. It's very difficult to get I'll consensus. Say to okay, you know, yeah, exactly, yeah, that's yeah, my yeah, point. Yeah. If you bring me 10 muftis, maybe I convince one, and his his opinion is valid, mm. is it not? 100%. If he's a, he's a scholar, yeah. he's a mufti, his mm. opinion is valid, okay. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to say. Mm. In my opinion, that's for corporal punishment. Don't hold yourself back. Learn everything. Mm -hmm. there, in my opinion, there is nothing out there that's true that's going to harm me. Mm. Truth never harms me. And this is Ghazali important, by the way. Mm. Truth never harms me. Bring it. I'm not scared of the truth. Me and my kids, they're raised in a mixed society. I don't tell them that there's no such thing as atheists. No, everybody believes in God. Everybody believes in God. No, I don't tell them that. Mm -hmm. I say some people think we're crazy. Mm -hmm. Some people think that there's no God. Some people think that this man is God. Some people think that this crocodile is God. Some People have all sorts of opinions. Here's why we believe what we believe. Mm -hmm. This is what I tell them. Would you push your kids to the direction of MMA though? I, I have a standard for my kids. I want them to be black belts. Yeah. Experts in self-defense. Yeah. And then later they're going to do what they want to do. Mm. Because maybe they're predisposed to medicine. Maybe they're predisposed to mm. some other type of athletic ability. Mm. Maybe one of my sons is going to be a, a, an excellent, uh, I don't know, chess player. Or whatever whatever it may be. Yeah. What I want is excellence. You've got really interesting family dynamic. In fact, one of the <laughs> um, the, the kind of vlogs that you've done online is, is a day in your life. They kind of yeah, followed yeah, you around yeah, and yeah. so on and so forth. Uh, I, th I found it interesting, really, what you're talking about 
um, interacting with your children. Um, we had a part of our vlog that we were talking about kind of like how you're dealing with your children, how you kind of parent them and teach them and spend a lot of time with them and um, establish deep and meaningful connections with mm -hmm, them. Mm -hmm. What kind of advice would you give um, people, generally speaking, on bonding with, with, with their children, teaching their children martial arts, uh, teaching their children different things? How, mm. how do you do it? What kind, of, what kind of routine have you put in place for your kids? Well, here, here's what I would say. Look, every generation yeah. has their own culture, their own, their own time. And it gives them a certain way of life and a certain paradigm. They look at the world in a certain way. Mm. Then a younger generation comes and they're different. Mm. And the things that they like and do or behave in their culture, it can, it can push you away from them. It could separate us. Mm. Because you'll be like, oh, the way they think, the way they are, the way. But the truth of the matter is you didn't grow up in their world. So you don't understand. You're alienating yourself from your kids. So mm. for me, I want to avoid that as much as possible. I share everything they do. If they're interested in something, I'm interested in it. Mm. Like my kids, they were like scooters, you know, like uh, skateboarding, but like with a scooter. Mm. Okay, yeah, we all go together. I rent one. I'm doing it with them. I'm watching the YouTube videos on the tricks, how they do it. And we're hanging out. We're, we're being close. Mm. Doesn't matter the activity. Whatever. They like video games. This video game you like, I like it. Let's play. We play mm. together for an hour or two. You have to get into their world. You have to share what they do. Because what happens is, if they love one thing and you love another and there's no common interest, there's nothing really to talk about. There's nothing to bond. Me and my kids were very, very close. But also there's the flip side of the coin. When it's time to work, it's time to work. Like me, I'm, I'm the kind of father. If you did everything you're supposed to do, I let you do, I give you whatever you want. You know, like my kids, they're like this video game, that video game, this shirt, that. Done. If you did your work. If you didn't do your work, you get nothing. That's how, that's how I believe it is the right way because you can ruin a kid, you can ruin a child by giving him something for free. And I always, I like to liken it to a, a, a jungle cat and a, and a tiger in the zoo. Two different, same animal genetically, mm. but two different animals in, in another sense because the jungle cat, he doesn't need you. He can kill and eat on his own. He's, he's independent. He's truly free. That tiger that was born in the zoo, he's tamed. He's lost something. And, and Nietzsche wrote a lot about this as well. He's lost something. He's become dependent on his master. Yeah, he's dangerous. He has claws and that. But if I put him back in the wilderness, he's going to die. This type of independence, this strong independence, I think is, is it's the root of insecurities. Imagine I, I could take you and drop you off somewhere in the wilderness, like just helicopter, you drop you off, in the, and you come back, and that was nothing to you. Oh, no, I don't care if they freeze my bank accounts. I don't care if they try to put me in jail. I'm gonna, like, you're so resourceful, nobody can do anything to you. Now, that would be a true freedom, you know? Mm -hmm. That's, so, of course, it's an exaggerated example, but that's how close you wanna build, that's the direction you wanna build. Whereas today, a lot of us are building towards the other direction. I want to be more comfortable. I want to be more dependent on the person I work for. So for instance, I don't work for nobody. Nobody tells me what to do. If I worked for a boss and maybe he's rude to me, I'm going to be like, I let him be rude to me because he signs my paycheck and I need that paycheck. So I'm dependent on that person. And this is the th type of stuff I try to keep my kids away from. Mm. And the reason why you're dependent on, on that person is because there's something you don't know. That's how my philosophy, there's something you don't know. You should only depend on God. In my opinion, that's the only thing. Like when I eat, when I drink, when I, I think, oh, alhamdulillah, I got this from God. I don't believe that the guy who wrote my paycheck, that's, that guy controls my destiny. I don't believe that. I don't, like if I, I, I've worked for people, but I, didn't, I never believed that that guy feeds me. I never believed this in my life, never. No, I, I couldn't even fathom that because that would mean that I'm dependent on another human being. So this is what I want to instill in my kids. One, you're completely independent from everyone, only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that, in my opinion, is the true freedom. Because if something bad happens to you, if somebody came, for instance, came in this, uh, in this room and lit this building on fire, and I got bad burns, I wouldn't say that that's the guy who did it to me. I would use that language, you know, I take him to, I would follow the procedures normal human beings do, but I would still believe this is Qadr Allah. This was brought to me by Allah. Nobody can burn me. Nobody can harm me. Nobody can do anything to me and nobody can save me. 
And this is true freedom, in my opinion. Me, I never see anything that came to me that's good that's from anything but Allah. And if it's bad, it's from Allah as well. Like, uh, this is my, this is what I deserve. Mm. So this is, the, I, my opinion, the mentality. Because for me, depending on somebody is unacceptable, in my opinion. It's unacceptable in my mind. And this is what I want to instill in my kids. But we're inter interdependent. Yeah. We, ch we, we, hang, we stay together because we want to be together. You know, like fighters, they come to me to the gym. They say, how much? I say, it's free. Train here and pay what you want. And other coaches, they tell me, oh, I trained this guy for five years, then he left. Yeah, let him go. Oh, yeah, but what about my five years? Let him go. Khalas. That's his life. That's his journey. If you're a great trainer, he's going to come back. He's going to come. Me, I never, I never put a contract with a fighter. Never. You want to train here? because you, you train here because you want to train here. Nobody trains here because they're under a contract. And if I'm not good enough of a trainer, don't train with me. That's it. Because I'm focused on me knowing, me knowing what I have to know. Because the root of all people's ills is they don't know. There's something they don't know. Mm. Like, for instance, there's people in the world, you give them $100, mm. and they'll turn that $100 into $1,000. Why? They mastered the art of money. Money is an art. It's a science. He could take that $1,000 and I'll make it $10,000. He dedicated his life to learn everything about money. I believe that if I, want, if I wanted to be rich, I would, read, I would research immensely how to create wealth. And that's all I would do all the time until I become rich. And I believe everybody has that ability. Everybody. It's just that people don't know that what's standing between them and their goal is just ignorance. Well, uh, that's that's quite deep. I, I, I do believe that's quite deep. I think a lot of people will know now that you've got a spiritual side, a philosophical side. We're seeing more and more sides to Faraz Zahabi the more we talk to him. But one thing I wanted to kind of bring to the attention of the Muslim community and kind of get your advice on, potentially one of the things that we'll kind of close off with, um, is healthy living. Mm. Um, because that's one of your areas of expertise. You've, you've researched quite deeply and heavily into it because you've had to for because you've trained fighters because you train mm. different kinds of people from different kinds of um, sports my question is simple question how do you maintain healthy living what kind of food should people do balanced diet what kind of things do you recommend the number one rule for when it comes to nutrition in my opinion is whole foods mm. the less it's processed the better so an apple is whole it wasn't machine there wasn't it wasn't, there was no sugar or preservatives added to it. Uh, fruits and vegetables should be the bulk of your diet. Um, grains, I believe in eating grains. Like some people go no carb. I believe if you're, if you're an athletic, if you're an, a person who's training physically, you should eat some carbohydrates. They should be controlled. Maybe eat them at breakfast, lunch. Carbohydrates, for, for instance, is rice, bread, quinoa. Hmm. Not all carbo, excuse me, not all carbohydrates are created equal. Learn what carbohydrates are the healthiest. It's the most natural. Hmm. So and uh, is white bread, white, white rice. White bread is processed. Bread is processed. Yeah. So I'd want like a quinoa, a potato, mm. uh, baked potatoes is good. Um, even some pastas, you know, some of them are made. Um, you can have some processed foods, okay? But I would eliminate processed foods until I'm as lean as I want to be. Then I would reintroduce them. And what what should it be? Ten to twenty percent. Uh, listen, I, I like, uh, I would say 10 to 15 is good. 10 to 15 for most people is yeah. good. That's like really healthy. I think, look, if you ate fruits and vegetables only, you'd become lean. Mm. Your body will be, naturally become lean. Now, add a little bit of carbs when you train really hard. If you're, if you're an athlete, um, fats, healthy uh, uh, fats from uh, uh, natural sources like olive oil, avocado, nuts, as natural as you can get. Mm. Oftentimes it's called a paleo diet. I hate to use that word because uh, paleo diet is it's it's not accurate. It's more of a marketing term. But whole foods. Once you once you're eating whole foods, now it's time to start to because okay, those are the foods I can't eat. Now how much should I eat? How much should I eat? Well, this is what I like to say. I like to I like to front load. So have breakfast, have lunch, and then okay because during the day you're gonna be very active. You know you're doing your routine. At night, skip dinner or have a very small dinner. Like me, I skip dinner. I have breakfast, lunch, and I'll skip dinner. When I need to lose weight, get to lean up a little more, I skip dinner. It's one of the strategies I employ. I have other ones as well. 
but I'll just skip dinner. I'll skip a meal. What's the best way to lose weight? Um, the fastest way. Now they're all listening. Fastest way? <laughs> yeah. I would say one meal a day. Yeah. Let's say you're not super active. Okay. Mm. If you're if you're an athlete, if you're in the gym twice a day, uh, no, eat eat throughout the day. However, most people tell me, coach, I can't train. I have this. I have kids. I have this. Okay. So then do one meal a day. Right. Just wake up. Don't eat. Have your dinner, one regular meal, mm. and you'll lose weight. And you won't you won't have any health problems. You won't have any any deficiencies. Just eat a, a, a healthy meal at night, one meal. See what happens after six months. You're not going to be hungry until lunchtime. Uh, sorry, dinner time. Mm. You won't be hungry. Morning, lunch, you won't be hungry. So fasting maybe. Fasting, yeah, absolutely. Mm. Mm. Some, some people fast 24 hours. Some people fast 48 hours. Fasting is extremely healthy. For instance, in 2016... They gave the Nobel fr Prize for the discovery of autophagy. Autophagy, look, I'm not a biologist, but in layman's terms, I'm trying to do it uh, as much justice as I can. Basically, if you don't eat for a prolonged period of time, your body will start to eat the bad cells. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to, I don't know the, I don't recall the exact term, but basically there are cells that are replicated that are replicated um, uh, not exactly. Okay, they're, they're bad cells. Okay, again, please forgive the terms. These cells are digested, eaten by the body. They're destroyed by the body if there's no food coming in for a prolonged period of time. So the, the body will start to destroy, eat those cells first. So I really recommend the work of Jason Fung. Jason Fung uh, does a tremendous amount of, um, yeah. did a tremendous amount of work on, on uh, uh, research on fasting. Mm. And uh, he mentions autophagy in his work and he even believes it cures cancer. Now, so, yeah. What do you think of ketogenic diets? Ketogenic diet is good for, for somebody who's not very active. So ketogenic diet, for those of you who don't know, is you really limit your carbs to about 50 grams per day. That would be the average. Okay, so 50 grams of carbs per day. So basically you're eating greens, fats, and a little bit of protein. Mm. You're not eating even fruit. Now, it's not bad because you're never spiking your insulin. So you're going to start losing fat. I guarantee you, if you do ketogenic diet, you're going to lose fat. However, you lose a lot of muscle as well. You lose muscle. You won't be bulky, okay? So, for instance, a lot of people you see on Instagram, YouTube, these guys are on steroids, okay? They're telling you ketogenic diet, this and that, but they're on steroids. They don't tell you they're on steroids, but they're on steroids. They're on, they're on, you know, they bulk up. Because the thing is, when you eat carbohydrates and you do spike your insulin, yes, it makes your fat cells bigger, but it also makes your muscle tissue bigger. So, for instance, a lot of ketogenic. Uh, diet, uh, people who are on the ketogenic diet, they'll also eat carbs at the right time. So before they go lift, bodybuild, or their sport, they'll eat rice. They'll spike their insulin because they need to feed that muscle. And even some will do it afterwards if they feel they need to bulk up even more. So they eat rice before and after. But because you're exercising intensely, you're burning those carbohydrates very quickly. And then you're back into your keto uh, burning phase. So for instance, um, to put it simply, when you eat carbohydrates, let's call it rice, bread, potatoes, your body fills your glycogen reserves. Your glycogen reserves, is, think about the, the, carb, the, the carbohydrates will go into your muscle, directly into your muscle, okay? Now, if there's an excess of carbs, then those carbs, after all the muscles are full of glycogen, your body's going to turn that into fats. Okay, forgive the terms. I'm not a biologist. I'm just giving you guys... Um, uh, it's, it's probably uh, better in a that. nutshell what yeah, I've yeah. been taught okay yeah. working with so many nutrition experts mm. they say okay look that's converted to fat if your reserves in your muscles are depleted you're, you have no glycogen in your muscle and you eat rice right before and then you go train your body is going to prioritize that carbohydrate for the intense training you're about to do mm. and to increase the muscle mass so mm -hmm. it's called carb timing you time your carbs just right carb timing mm-hmm now, look, my opinion, this works. I've done it. It works. Uh, for me, it doesn't fit my lifestyle. So what I do is I eat my carbs in the morning. I eat my carbs at lunch. I go train, and then I go to bed. I don't eat, I don't, I don't eat any foods. I just drink water. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, my carbohydrate levels are depleted. When I wake up in the morning, I replenish them, and I go to train. And then I eat carbs in the afternoon. So me, I eat my carbs in the morning and in the afternoon. front loading? Front loading means I'm mm. having my food early in the day. Mm. Why am I front loading? Because I'm active during the day. Yeah. If you take two groups of people, one group that eats one meal a, 
a day at night. And, and uh, Jason Fung did this experiment, okay? He says, look, one group ate their meal at night and one group ate their one meal. So they're only eating, both groups are eating one meal in 24 hours. One eats it in the afternoon, the other one eats it at night. The one who ate it in the afternoon, they lost more weight. Why? When you eat during the day, you have more energy. Mm. So you're going to be more active. So if I give you, if I give you, they've done this experiment as well. Take two groups. One group, we give them carbohydrates. One group, we don't give them carbohydrates. We put them keto. Both groups work out. The keto group spends more energy. They're far more active. So if we ask them to do any exercise, they're going to have more energy. The keto group is like lagging behind and they need, that's why even the keto practitioners will eat carbs before training. They see the importance of carbs. The way I strategize it is to make it really simple and make my life more simple because for me, timing my food right before practice, it's too complicated. I eat my carbs in the morning. I eat my natural foods in the morning. I eat my carbs in the morning. Then I have my lunch. And at 6 o'clock, I stop eating. So I eat from okay. 10 to 6. You now stop eating carbs or just Everything, any- all together, just water. Uh-huh. That's why today I'm just eating drinking water. Right. Now, if I want to lose even more weight, let's say, I, okay, now it's, it's I have to trim down a little more. I'll stop eating at 3. So I go eat from 10 to 3. Hmm. For a while. Well, not forever. For a while. And then, okay, when I lean up, okay, now I start eating from 10 to 6 again. Hmm. If I have a wedding or a family uh, get together, I won't eat 24 hours before. So I, when I sit down, when they offer me food, I won't be like, no, I can't eat. So this diet, it fits my lifestyle. Yeah. So I have like when I go see my mother, I have to eat. Mm. When, I, my, when I take my family to go see my mother, she's gonna cook <laughs> more than I can eat. You know, like mm-hmm. she's gonna, my mom is incredible. Mm. Uh, you gotta eat. You can't go there now and say, mm. I can't eat. Mm. You have to eat. Mm. So I know this, I won't eat 24 hours before. So I can eat and it won't change my body composition. Mm. That's pretty straightforward. I think a lot of people would grasp that. That's, that yeah, it's very that's, easy, yeah, very yeah. easy. 10 to six or mm. one meal. Yeah. If you have a special occasion, yeah. 24 hours don't eat before. Mm. That's it. On that note, Jazakum Allah Khairan for your beautiful brother. insights on so many issues. I think there's going to be a lot of muftis thinking about the stuff that you talked inshallah. about. Inshallah, we just need one. One, <laughs> one, authentic, one highly respected, yeah, inshallah. Yeah, yeah. Actually, do you know, to be fair, the, 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 there's there's a book that Ibn Taymiyyah wrote called Rafa Al-Malam. And he, he said that if you want to follow an opinion, it should be min ta'ifatun, uh, min ta'ifatun min al-alama. So it should be a group of scholars. Mm, okay. Because one person can just say anything. Mm, exactly. You'll find that. I agree with you. But yeah. Once again, we'll leave it to the muftis. They're Inshallah. probably listening to you. But Jazakum Allah Khairan for your insights. It's been really incredible. We've got, uh, we usually talked about philosophy, but today mm-hmm. we've got, we changed the script a little bit. I'm sure uh, we'll be speaking about philosophy in, in, in upcoming uh, uh, engagements. And uh, that ends today's uh, episode of Rerooted. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.